we're just gonna, we're going to try and draw it to draw it to a close with with uh, some comments about where's the market going. Could I invite to the stage Patrick Svensson Gilstead from Vodafone? Francis is going to rejoin us from uh, Deutsche Telekom, and Mirko Voltolini has kindly stepped in because Kerry's still waiting for her train down somewhere in Hampshire. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, to the stage, thank you. Now. Um, Obviously, uh, so Patrick, I know we've talked a little bit. I, I'd like to give you a chance just to say a few things since you've not been part of uh, the panel. So John, John's already had his chance, France has. So I'd like to give Patrick and Mirka just a chance just to give a few minutes just to, to uh, outline your position. So where, you know, th this issue is, we're bringing it all together. We've talked about where's the telco in the digital economy. We've talked about consumer and business. We've talked about cloudification, the move to cloud. We've talked about the edge. You know, as, a, as someone, or perhaps introduce yourself and your role within Vodafone first. Yes, thank you. Great to be here. So I'm Patrick Svensson. I'm heading up the global strategy for Vodafone Business. And listening to many of the conversations here today, it, it, it reminds me of a situation I was in in the late 90s, working with, with a telco and with a car manufacturer trying to bring internet into the car. And expectations were extremely high because there had been some massive changes back in 99. You had not only 2.5G, you had 2.75G. You had an amazing thing called WAP uh, for, for, for building internet applications and mobile phones. You had, uh, you had something called en Enterprise Java Beans for building sort of distributed applications. You had, something, you, you had plenty of dot-coms coming up with very imaginative uh, use cases for what to do with internet in a car. And, uh, we worked and worked on this cross-functional team, very agile, and it just didn't work. Absolutely no progress. Very complex kind of solution, completely unreliable. Um, when, when something eventually started working, it was so slow that it, it was ridiculous. And the, uh, the, uh, at the end of the day, the car manufacturer thought, this is just way too complex, too much of a hassle, too risky, and they pulled the plug and they walked away. And, and to be frank, the, 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 the full power and precision of the German language was, was used to describe how dissatisfied they were with the situation. And today, 20 years later, when, when you talk to some customers, businesses, um, and how they, they experience digitalization, they express some, of the, some, some similar frustrations. Um, that is, this, it's still too much of a hassle. It's, it's still too risky. And, this is despite the fact that we soon have 5G and we have, we have edge computing and we, um, uh, we, we have the cloud and things like that. And the, the way we propose to think about that is that if you take one step back, today we have companies in, in different verticals, um, in, in, in different geographies with, with very different starting points. You have some, some companies that are still busy fundamentally connecting people and places and things moving into the cloud. They have one set of pain points. You have some companies that are a bit further ahead. They are, they are starting to actually build digital-first products, digital-first um, uh, processes. They, they start to experience other pain points. Uh, we discussed culture earlier during the day, skill sets, things like that. And you have some, some companies which are even further ahead, trying to build, th trying to sort of crash the, the digital silos, build truly integrated uh, systems where you leverage data and analytics at scale to continuously innovate and, and drive service innovation and, and productivity improvements and so on. And they all have different, uh, different uh, needs and different pain points. And probably for us to, or at least us, for us as telcos, to be successful in that kind of uh, environment, we need to get a lot closer to, to understanding what those customer needs are. And we need to think about, as, as mentioned before, business outcomes. We need to, at some point, we need to, to stop talking about bandwidth and latency and what the customers really care about, which is to you know, make the sale, make sure the production is, is, is up and running. And we need to be able to talk that language. And we, we need to start talk that language as customers. Our services need to talk that language as well. So we, we need to make sure that the, um, the services and solutions we provide, that they actually become application aware, they become business aware. And when we're at that point, then, then we're in a much better place to make sure that digitalization is, is uh, not a hassle, uh, not risky, but something which actually makes all of these hopes come true. Okay. 
Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and I'll come back to some of those comments later because you, you weren't around for all of the things earlier on. Uh, Mirko, welcome back. You're always Thank you. welcome. Um, I, I know you said Kerry had prepared a presentation. I don't yeah, she did. She did. Uh, she actually had quite a wonderful speech, uh, which uh, was about uh, chaos theory and the butterfly effect. And if you all flaps our wings, uh, something uh, wonderful will happen somewhere in the world. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I won't do her speech. Uh, um, so I'll give you my perspective. Uh, as a fixed uh, carrier uh, service provider, uh, communication service provider, we see our uh, B2B only, we see our enterprise customers uh, all moving through uh, digital transformation and that uh, typically comes with uh, the customer view in mind as was just pointed out. Uh, that is the typical angle they start from and then moves into looking at how they transform their processes, uh, the systems, uh, the people and organization and ultimately uh, some of them, a good part of them are also relooking really at how they their business model works in the market. And we see uh, them adopting a number of different technologies uh, that are now uh, available uh, in a more uh, flexible, agile way than there was in the past. Uh, and I can mention, uh, I think you guys probably have spoken about this today. I mean, Edge was one of the, the things mentioned, but uh, IoT, AI, uh, software centricity, leveraging data, uh, big data. Uh, so all these capabilities have uh, uh, are now part of uh, this, this type of uh, transformation in the industry. Uh, but what, what's actually happening to the, to the co connectivity to the network? Uh, if you look at uh, the history of, uh, of uh, carrier service providers, uh, we've been kind of stuck in a world where everything has been statically delivered uh, with uh, long de delivery time scales uh, and uh, a lack of flexibility. You have to wait for uh, as a minimum 30 days to get a uh, service delivered. And you probably can't get away completely from the underlay physical infrastructure. However, we now see, and thanks again to the technology enablers, uh, in particular SDN and AV virtualization, uh, that we can adopt uh, a similar approach for the network, uh, that we, we start to see the opportunity to deliver on-demand uh, connectivity services on top of a fixed underlay uh, in a real-time fashion, uh, providing the opportunity for customers to quickly change uh, uh, endpoints, uh, topology, connectivity, bandwidth uh, to serve uh, demands uh, coming, for instance, from cloud uh, uh, connectivity. Uh, lots of enterprises are moving applications uh, to the cloud. Uh, we have quite a few ongoing at the moment. Uh, but also not necessarily just uh, the underlay, uh, underlying technology, but also the business model. Uh, providing customers with a, a pay-as-you-go type of uh, a consumption model moves them away from uh, statically uh, buying a service for uh, 12 months or, or uh, X number of years. And I think that uh, is, uh, we see that there's the way to, to get uh, away from uh, seeing the network as a cost center, because uh, today, if you speak with uh, procurement uh, departments in enterprises, they see that, okay, the network, huh? how can I reduce the cost of that rather than, uh, the, the equation is to move to the, to the point of uh, how can we leverage the network to become part of this, the overall digital transformation. So being part of the uh, agile uh, user experience we want to build for our customers. We did quite a lot of uh, work in this space over the last few years. I actually ran this uh, call to on-demand function, so we'll, we'll talk about that maybe during the panel. Thank you very much. Uh, to, to Franz and John, I guess my, my first question is, were there any big questions not raised today or topics not raised today that you think are important shaping the future of the telecom industry in this market? I think maybe a, a, a topic um, is around partnerships um, with non-traditional industry players okay. um, and how important that is going to be for most of our ambitions as telcos into new verticals. Um, I think there is a huge communication challenge between the telcos and these you know, component manufacturers, robotics manufacturers, component partners with industry. And <coughs> we really need to get to grips with speaking their language if we're going to deliver these outcomes that we are essentially banking on for incremental growth. So I think looking at those industry verticals, thinking about who the players are that we need to integrate with and how we better work together and communicate um, would be a good topic to sort of deep dive because I don't think we've answered those questions yet as an industry. Mm -hmm. And France? Um, I think all topics have been mentioned. Um, uh, probably not all on, 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 on the level of depth 
they would desire or they would they would need. Um, and the two topics uh, I mentioned before in the in the earlier panel for me, which I believe we still need to go deeper, is the, on the one side the automation orchestration piece. We all know we need it. We all struggle still. How how, how do we get it? And and the other one which came up more prominently rather recently is is, is clearly um, the exercise so this open run and, and these type of topics why is that because this is where the money goes access is by far the biggest part of the if you're mobile right but also in fixed this is where the majority of of, of the of the money goes so and, and this we did left out of this whole cloud piece up to now for good reasons because it's even more complex it's the, the software is more difficult and you go to even more sites and, and we still struggle to properly run a distributed cloud infrastructure because this is what the the web scale players don't, don't do that well either because they have their big regions and, and and so it's also still a bit more static but i, I think the time it starts to become ripe now to to get this going quite quite more importantly going forward from here so, so the, the, the sort of topic the overriding topic of the panel is where, where's the market going now if we <clears throat> if we can take as read that the market and i think it's 1.4 trillion dollars globally 60 <coughs> percent is consumer 30 percent is business and 10 percent is other let's say mm -hmm. can we can, given that consumer is generally under much more commercial pressure and it's that's being pressured downwards. Can we grow the enterprise market enough to make up for that loss to, to grow that piece of the business? Or is, or is that 10% at the end of the, the, the other 10%, which is sort of wholesale and content and things, do we have to grow that? Which bit of the market do we have to grow most aggressively? Patrick, you, you mentioned about the, you're obviously globally looking at the global strategy for Vodafone business. It, can we grow that bit aggressively enough? Are we not competing with too many other players in that market already? No, I, th I, think, I think we can, but it does link also to one, linking back to your previous question of things we did not discuss. And I think that one, if you look at many of the faster growing hyperscaler and ICT players that we typically like to compare ourselves with, there are a few things that set them apart from us. One, one thing relates to outsized ambitions. Uh, another thing relates to customer experience, but it also relates to, to having own IP, customer facing IP. And we as an industry, we have historically have been investing a lot into our networks for good reasons. Um, we now see that the, 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 the marginal ROI on that might be challenged in the future. And at some point there needs to be a discussion about um, shifting the business model a bit and investing more in, into directly customer facing IP as well that goes beyond connectivity. And I think that's going to be a prerequisite for, for, for doing really well uh, beyond connectivity, which is the prerequisite for doing well with business. What, what kind of IP do you think telcos could invest in? That's a really good question. I, I, think, it, I think it still starts with, and co coming back, that we need to take, take out the, the hassle uh, and the risk of buying technology. And I think re regarding the hassle, there, there's, still, there's still a lot for us to fix in terms of the plumbing, the basic plumbing, uh, which we need to invest in. I think in terms of... of um, more customer facing and, and, and sort of business outcome generating uh, capabilities. We also need to invest more in making, making our services application aware, business aware, to deliver those business outcomes. That gives, them, gives us a much stronger platform to play from. Cool. In that, so, so John, with your, in, in the CTIO office within, uh, within, BT, within BT, for example, is there are we seeing consumer business convergence? Are we dealing with the same thing? Or is it very separate areas still? There is, there's some areas um, of, of crossover, um, certainly where we're delivering potentially 5G on a public network um, for consumer application, but also there's a, there's a business benefit. So one of the great things about being the first to launch 5G in the UK was we immediately went out and started talking to business customers in those areas where we launched. Obviously, it was a consumer launch, um, but it gave us the ability to go out and say, you know, what are your guys' challenges? How are you going to start to consume this? Um, but in the in the um, CTIO office, you know what we're doing specifically for enterprises to look at all of our underlying products and technology capabilities, the new things we want to build, um, and creating cross vertical capabilities. So, for instance, we do a, you know augmented reality, mixed reality, connected ambulance over five G. 
Um, what we can also do is, is adapt that for you know, uh, routines for crane operators or um, you know, field services. So I think if we start to think about where the market is going and how we sort of cross over the capabilities, obviously augmented reality, virtual reality is also has consumer application. We're using the public network. It's how we can build a single capability, partner with the right players, so we can touch multiple verticals. Obviously, we want to create propositions for healthcare. We want to create propositions for mining and production. But if we can create a, a horizontal capability that touches every, every industry, then essentially we get better return on our investment. Um, and if consumers are part of that and they can benefit from, from what we've delivered, absolutely, you know, we'll, we'll capitalize on that investment. But there's something that strikes me about what you've just said, actually, uh, in the context of the previous great telco debates that we've done, because this is the sixth one. And I think this time uh, is the first time, that, and it's not just you, Joel, but it's the first time I've heard people talk about verticals, mm -hmm. right? This is not something that, that the telco industry used to talk about. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, but, but I think it's kind of dawning on people that actually, if you really want to deliver value, uh, you might be using the same building blocks, but if you want to deliver value, you really have to understand how an airport works, how a port works, how a hospital works, you know, what is it they're trying to achieve and where do you fit into that plan? So, so that's just an observation from mm. me, really, Chris. Well, I was going to say the opposite. I was going to say we're talking about, <laughs> I was going to say we're talking about building blocks, aren't we? That, mm -hmm. you know, that actually what we need to have is building blocks that are reusable. We talk about it in open source, about reusable codes and so on. In a sense, we need it at the at building blocks at the same layer. Uh, but, Merkin, my question to you is going to be, um, are you seeing similar crossover between the wholesale and the, and the enterprise market? Or, or are they very, very distinct markets? Uh, I mean, ultimately, with the, within the wholesale market, we actually serve enterprises because the end customers are enterprises. Huh? Uh, I think if I look at uh, the consumption model and what they buy, uh, the, the market is still a little bit uh, different. In the enterprise, we start to see, I was mentioning this transformation moving to, to a space, you go uh, consumption model. In the enterprise space, that, that is happening, is happening. Uh, uh, fast in certain sectors, and I think we do have uh, verticals. Back to your point, uh, uh, historically we've been focused a lot on uh, on financial services. We have also a media vertical, uh, isn't a separate business unit, but we do have a focus. I think it's it's a it's a, it's a good comment about uh, getting close to customers. Uh, but back to the question, uh, we see wholesale being more driven uh, by traditional model, although they are starting to look into uh, consumption. Uh, model that uh, are, are more digital oriented. However, uh, their services uh, are in the large majority still uh, traditional services. So we start to see these separations of the, the market in terms of how they approach consumption services. Some enterprises are more, more advanced. And we see a, a number of emerging uh, smaller enterprises maybe that are uh, much more aggressive in the way they see the network as an enabler of, uh, of, uh, of change rather than, uh, again, a cost center, as was mentioning earlier. Graham? Hello. Any other questions? Well, do you know what? I, so, so just... Um, you know, I'm so pleased because I didn't know where you were sitting and I suddenly <laughs> heard your voice next to me. Like, you know. So just following on from this whole thing we were talking about B2B and B2B2C, I also think that, uh, that we are learning more about uh, consumers as well. And, and I was just going to um, give a shout out to Nick Green, actually, and uh, from Three, and Roz Singleton, who was formerly at UK Broadband, owned by Three, um, because the interesting stuff that, with, that they've done with consumer fixed wireless access has taught, uh, taught us a lot about how consumers actually use uh, a 4G and now 5G broadband service, and how it's different, actually, to how they might consume a fibre broadband service and how it might be uh, appealed differently to different people. Uh, and, and one of the interesting things that's brought out is that there are some people who just want broadband now, right? They move into an apartment, they want it now, right? As in, they want to, they want to go on the web at 11 o'clock and get it by 5 o'clock. And, and the interesting thing about using wireless networks to do that is that you can actually fulfil their request because you don't have to you know, connect anything up, you don't have to dig up the road, you can actually just deliver it to their office or their, or their apartment and take it home. So, so I think in the same way that, that we're, 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 we're learning more and more about 
business customers through focusing on verticals. I also think that these new technologies are kind of encouraging us to find out more about consumer behaviour as well and their requirements. That's just an observation. So no, and, and, and I think the other important thing about that is the we were talking earlier about um, players and their <clears throat> someone said about Netflix competing and so on. Actually, that market is fragmented has fragmented a lot from where the cable operators owned effectively the, the content. Certainly, if you're if you're a cable heavy country, and that they're coming under pressure. You know, Netflix could come under a lot of pressure in the near future because of Disney breaking off and fragmenting it and so on and so forth. Um, but I agree. Listen to the consumers, and they, as someone said early on, we don't know what they want. We don't know what they want. <clears throat> Patrick, can I come back to you? Something you said in your opening comment. You said you need to listen to the customers more. Do you do you have the, the pardon the pun the bandwidth to listen to those customers and get in front of all those customers, or is that just a luxury you can do at the high end of the market for the enterprise customers? No, I, th I think the, the benefit of digital technology is that uh, you can automate many things as well. So yes, the, the, there's definitely a the human component to listening. Um, and we, we as telcos probably need to expand that one as well. But you can learn a lot from, from, from data analytics these days. And uh, we, have, we have so many sources of information about what, uh, uh, what both business and consumer customers uh, actually use our technology for, um, what, how, how they prefer to use it, both explicitly and Im implicitly. And we need, to, um, uh, we, we need to find good, responsible ways uh, of leveraging all of that information. And of course, uh, then also translate that into some of the things we can see that the OTT players are doing to improve their customer experience with you know, very, uh, very sophisticated self-serve kind of capabilities, um, very, very, very intelligent automation, and so on. And in the, at the same time as we serve customers using those tools, we also learn about them. And we need to leverage that. And we need to, in the same way as we will have to enable our customers to tie together what happens with, within their supply chain with what happens in their marketing department and with their partners, we need to tie that together as well um, within our companies. And then we can, we can be a lot better at listening to customers. The, the, okay. I guess, sir? Okay. The, the, one, okay. the one area that I think hasn't been touched upon, um, and we, did, we, we had a debate specifically on it last year, was artificial intelligence and, hmm. and this whole, uh, and perhaps it's at the end of that debate, we couldn't decide what it was anyway. Uh, but it, I, I think that, that whole operational efficiency side, using data which isn't specifically within just one silo and kept in one, obviously within the realms of GDPR and, and, other, and other regulations and so on. Uh, I don't know, Franz, do you have a comment on AI and, and machine yeah. learning? Is that, does that, are we beginning to apply that yes. throughout the organization? Um, in principle, yes. I mean, AI is a topic in itself and that's probably, again, something, what do you exactly mean? But let's, let's stick with machine learning, because uh, already there you, you can do a lot. And, 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 and uh, one thing we currently experimenting with is really use these kind of, of, of te techniques to, to better steer your network planning and your network rollout. So to really understand where do, where do you have the biggest issues on, 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 on providing additional coverage. So very, very simple things in the end. But instead of, of manually trying to figure out where do you need to densify your network, you start to utilize such algorithms, use data sources, uh, not only from our network, because there is enough available also from, 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 from web skill players, and, and you can get access to these data just to see how they are utilized. And, 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 and there is a lot of, of data available. You just need to get it. You need to normalize it and, and, and feed it into the algorithms. And, and we got some really interesting results it's, if you look at it, it's not obvious in the first place why the machinery now suddenly suggests to put uh, additional coverage there. But once you start to dig deeper and analyze, you figure out, damn, it's right. Yeah? But you need to put additional data coming from additional sources together, and, and, and you get a, a different picture versus you only look at the data you get out of your own network. Yeah? And there is a lot of power in, in, in these algorithms, and, and we are now really starting to utilize and, and, and have first successful cases, which means more people uh, become aware. And, and so we, we see really a lot of, of good ideas coming up, how to utilize such kind of mechanisms to, to help to, to um, optimize custom experience at the end of the day. Can I just chip in? I wanted to of say something on top on, on the customer uh, engagement. I think it's uh, the model that uh, we've all been used to work with in terms of develop, developing capabilities that uh, you get uh, requirements uh, from the marketing team and then they go into uh, architecture, high-level design and engineering for the development, then you build uh, 
systems behind uh, around that and then you develop a capability after 12 months and then you go out to market uh, is gone. Uh, we now have uh, an approach where uh, customer development is, is an integral part of the of the development of new capabilities. You have to get in front of the customers to listen to what they need. Uh, the approach is uh, you build an MVP, uh, go out uh, to customers, uh, test uh, the the, the hypothesis, uh, take it back, uh, refine, then go back again until you get something that uh, uh, has a market. Uh, there is also a number of techniques that uh, we start to utilize uh, as you as you develop uh, capabilities that uh, get you in front of the customer with the digital platforms, uh, like uh, techniques like AB uh, marketing, where you test something out uh, for a certain number of users and then get the result back and see how that compares with other users. Those type of uh, experiences are quite now valuable to, to drive the development. So we should start to draw it to a conclusion, Graham. Yes. Uh, perhaps one last comment for everybody. What, what, so Patrick, what are you most, and then we'll, I'll come to each of you in turn, what are you most positive about and what worries you the most for the future of the market? Well, I, th I think mo most positive, uh, to do, I'm talking from an enterprise perspective, I think, uh, my, my, my worry is probably the, um, uh, the standard one that we still, as telcos, need to get our act together and move fast uh, to capture these kinds of opportunities. Yep. Historically, we have struggled with that, um, and we need to play it a bit differently this time around. Good one. John, do you want to go next? Yep. So I guess what I'm, um, what I'm excited about is you look, you look at the, the agenda today, we're talking about 5G, we're talking about cloud, we're talking about edge. You know, these are areas of pure innovation currently and, um, and partnerships, new partnerships. And, and that's the exciting thing, just for our colleagues to be able to come to work and say, look, we're doing things no one's ever done before. You know, we're delivering world firsts. We're working with new partners. We're breaking into new verticals, um, you know, and we're trying to seize the opportunities that this technology can provide, and I think that's just really inspiring for, for telcos, and I think we need to be optimistic. Yes, historically, we have worked slower, um, but I think we've all woken up. You know, we understand we've got the, with the MVP model, we're getting out there with customers, with, you know, you look, look at the use cases, 5G use cases for, for enterprise, you know, remote crane operation, you know, one gigabit per second uplink, 18 milliseconds latency to deliver, um, you know, productivity and safety improvements in, um, in ports controlling cranes. And then you look at how that could translate to construction and a whole host of other industries. You know, we're, we're right in the thick of it. And I think our broad experience as telco operators across the ecosystem from connectivity, cloud, and, you know, the partnerships that we can develop um, puts us in a really strong position. So there are worries, and it, I think you know, it's, you've put it perfectly. It's, a, it's around our agility and our speed. So we just need to, um, we just need to get off our asses and get it done. Get us there, Clip, Franz. Yeah, actually, I think I, 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 I fully go buy into that. We sometimes forget, or we are not fully aware, how important our networks are for society. I mean, if our networks wouldn't be there, we would, uh, I think, not, not too much would work anymore. So there's tremendous opportunity. There's, of course, also tremendous responsibility to make sure this, this, this goes forward and we provide the capacity that's required and, and, and all these things. And, and the worry, as, as said, is really, uh, are we able and are we in a good position to keep up with that demand, with the speed of change? Do we have the right uh, people, skills, and everything required to, to really deliver on, on that huge expectation and, and responsibility we have in the end? Merco. As a technologist, uh, I'm also quite excited about uh, the availability of uh, so many different options now that uh, can help us uh, uh, build uh, capabilities uh, in this digital space. It feels, feels quite liberating, uh, and uh, if I think about what we have had for a number of years, uh, it feels like uh, we now can eventually build uh, something which differentiates us in the market. Nobody has anymore to just go to the same vendors. You always get the same type of services. Now we have the opportunity. What I'm, so that's quite uh, exciting and I feel very positive about that. Uh, what I am concerned is on, kind of on the same line as everybody else, uh, but maybe adding another spin is uh, as a B2B provider, we need the collective uh, 
uh, force of uh, all the players in the market uh, to be able to deliver services end to end. And I'm talking about the other CSPs. Uh, we just can't deliver services by ourselves. Uh, and I think we need to get uh, collectively as an industry forward. Uh, it's not just the speed of how we move ourselves. We feel like uh, maybe we have some advanced capabilities, but uh, uh, our neighbors don't. So we can't really leverage it and uh, to provide an end to end experience, uh, especially for global multinational corporates that we serve, uh, we need the other carriers to be aligned to us uh, and have uh, that same level of capabilities. Uh, with differentiation, of course, but uh, as I said, to me, is uh, how can we move together as an industry? So this goes in the, the space of uh, APIs, uh, standards, and adopting uh, common uh, information models. More work together. Graham, what about you? Andy, what was your, your favourite debate during the day? Uh, uh, my my, my favourite debate was... Uh, about 5G, not being even another G. I like that a lot. You like the motion. Mm. I like the motion because it was controversial. Uh, but I, I'm going to answer the question you, you asked these guys, actually, which is, which is what, what am I most excited about and what am I most worried about? So what I'm most excited about is I think that we as an industry understand customers better than we ever have done. And, and, and certainly there's a massive change in my mind for, from when we were here six years ago, five years ago, however long it was, when we first started. I, I really do honestly think that we understand customers much, much better than we used to, whether they're business customers or consumers. What I'm most worried about is we're so slow. We're so slow that the universe will end before we take advantage of some of the things that we've learned. So, so those, those are my two kind of, you know, that's what I'm upbeat about and downbeat about. I must say one of, my, one of my biggest concerns is, is politicians hijacking telecoms as a, uh, <laughs> as a topic that just completely throws a spanner in the works. But, but I, I think the, that, that notion of the, the connectivity is, I mean, we, we had it originally in the, in the opening debate about, you know, connectivity has never been so important and yet the relative value. And I think that is a, a lesson and we've had it over telco debates to refer back to some of them. I think one of my favorite comments was around from Phil Jordan, the then CTO, group CTO at Telefonica, who just said, first of all, can we take the handbrake off virtualization because we're too slow, and then we're not hurting enough as an industry. So I think we are hurting enough. And we're beginning to hurt because the pressures on prices are coming down. So the realization from the, the sea levels about, because they're, they're, uh, they're not getting the growth they wanted, because in some cases we're actually shrinking as a market, but the realization of the relative role in the industry the fact that we're beginning to partner, I mean, the, the announcements with, um, with AWS, I think were very important, coming out of reInvent last week uh, in, in, in Vegas, around I think it was half a dozen uh, telcos announced partnerships around that front. I think what we heard from the, from the vendors, the suppliers in the debate just after lunch around, you know, the fact that they're going through the transformation journey as well, that they recognize they have to change. So there's a sort of a concatenation, a domino effect, if you like, all the way through the industry from the way that we live our digital lives. I thought Ross's point about um, the citizen services, and Francie you just made that comment, and then that, that responsibility around sustainability and getting everyone together is so, so important. You know, it's a, it's a, I mean, the great thing is that an industry when probably even six years ago, you know, or certainly when we started all those years ago, when no one had a clue what telecoms was all about, you know, now it, it shapes everybody's lives. Mm. And I think that, that's the important thing is actually making sure um, and I think uh, Nitu mentioned it in the previous session about putting the customer at the center of our thinking. We really do have to do that. Now, I think that has been a tokenist approach until now. I think we really have to make sure that we do, uh, to Patrick's point, listen to those customers and really get, and take on board what is being said. And not, you know, there's, there's a, the old statement about there's a reason why you've got two ears and one mouth is that you should listen twice as much as you speak. And I think this industry has definitely spoken way too much in the past about technology specifically and not listened enough to what's going on in the world. Now, I think we should wrap it up there, actually. Should we go and get drunk? I think we should go and get really <laughs> okay, drunk. <laughs> um, uh, gentlemen, thank you very much indeed <coughs> to, to Patrick, to Mirko, to Franz, and indeed to John. Thank you very much. Uh, don't go yet, because we're going we're to wrap it up. Thank you so much. Enjoy. I'm, I'm sure you've got a lot to take away with you from thoughts from today. We hope you've influenced you a little bit. We look forward to interacting in the future. Thank you ever so much. Oh, and just before you clap, oh, no. let's just say a massive, massive thank you to Chris, who's put together this whole event. So thank you very much. Thank indeed, you, Chris. Thank you very much.